It's a visit with a person of high strangeness. This is uh, number two in uh, in our mind series. And uh, last week we went to uh, to a talk to with Dr. Uh, Edgar Mitchell, and it was the quantum hologram. So today you're going to see him again for a minute, where he sort of explained. Uh, where he's going to explain to you how he got from here to there and um, and then we're going to go to uh, another friend, uh, Lynn Buchanan, one of the government remote viewers. So now, the reporter that went to interview Lynn Buchanan for me, his name is JFK, um, and he's in Michigan, so he is also uh, a remote viewer and that's why he asked the questions the way he did. So he took a trip from um, Detroit, Michigan to New Mexico where um, Lynn resides and taped this long interview with us that we're going to look at for the next, what, three weeks. Let's see what we have here. Um, Edgar, Dr. Mitchell, made reference to the Matrix uh, last week. And so we're going to talk about the Matrix for a little bit. And he also, um, well, he called it the absorption re-emission. And uh, so we're going to, well, actually, let him explain it, and then we'll look at it from another angle. And um, as you can see, I'm wearing my rags uh, from my Goodwill rag bag. And... Um, there was a lot of goodies. There were 14 goodies in my bag. So anytime you uh, feel like raggy, go there. It was great. And um, well, what can I tell you? I'm standing up momentarily. That doesn't happen very often anymore. So um, enjoy <laughs> because I can't stand very well anymore. 90 seconds, but I think I did two minutes already. So this is a record and I can prove I'm getting better. So anyway, let me quit rambling here and go and uh, reintroduce you to Dr. Edgar Mitchell. I'm real pleased to be with you this evening. I thank you for being here. We'll have <clears throat> a good time, and we will go until such time as either you're ready to quit or they throw us off the stage. <laughs> I only have about uh, 45 minutes worth of presentation material, but I hope I will generate a con enough controversy and enough questions in that period that uh, we can enter into dialogue. I, I enjoy the dialogue, I enjoy interacting, and I think that, uh, I, I think that we both, we all benefit much better when we do it that way. Now, just to get in to the, this program a bit, that's the reason I changed things around, I see John Alexander sitting out there, and he made some uh, remarks yesterday that I wanted to pick up on here. So we'll start with those. Let me get this slide going. And he put up his first one of his slides yesterday to talk about all the nasty things that people can say when they disagree with you and why science has uh, uh, fought the things we're talking about for so long. And that was the title of his slide. And he also uh, uh, pointed out as I said, the nasty things said about him and about all of us. So, and the title of that slide was Ad Hominem. So if we move on to today, I can point out some of the things that have been said about me as a result of being interested in this area and being associated with this sort of thing. And one of the first things they used to say 30 years ago, he got lost in space. And the second thing is, well, he's just a space cadet. <clears throat> and then some of them, uh, some of my colleagues who had worked with me for a while and still didn't quite know quite how to take me into how to take all of this stuff, uh, 
something strange happened out there, but he's too bright to argue with. But he sure has a lot of uh, weird facts that he throws at you. <laughs> well, that one came along. And then when I came out with the Way of the Explorer here five years ago, Kirkus Reviews, although other people gave me good one, Kirkus Reviews said he's trying to reinvent the wheel. And we're starting to talk about how does science and mystical experience fit together. <clears throat> But then the crowning put down of all, which I'm sure many of us have experienced, is just another bunny hugger. <laughs> so that fits a lot of us, I think. But what we're gonna talk about tonight, one of the things I wanted to point out to you before we get going, vis-a-vis -vis that last slide we had up of all the nasty things people say, and try to reject the ideas we've been putting out. First of all, why would a nice guy like me would they say things about, like that about? And that's because something strange did happen in space. It was the opportunity to see the universe and see the world from a different perspective. They say travel broadens. <laughs> Getting on a, a mountaintop broadens. It gives you a different point of view. Well, being able to look at Earth from an ET perspective uh, was pretty wow. Let me tell you a little bit about it because it did get this whole thing started with me. It was the peak experience, the Eureka experience, uh, an epiphany that uh, made me realize I had to change the way I was thinking. Now remember at that time I was a qualified Navy test pilot. I'd been in the Navy uh, 17, about almost 17 years at that time. <clears throat> had uh, PhD from MIT on aeronautics and astronautics, and about as linear left brain thinking as you could get. <clears throat> but also, in the years, few years before, I'd become interested in J.B. Ryan's work at Duke, and had been studying parapsychological literature. And uh, with just a few weeks to go before the flights, some uh, physician friends, two physician friends of mine, and I had said, you know, it'd be awfully nice to find out if this telepathy stuff worked at 200,000 miles, since nobody had had that opportunity before. So we cooked up an ad, ad hoc experiment, which most of you already know about, in order to test that out. However, that wasn't the high point. That was just another thing to do. <clears throat> But on the way home, after that was done, <clears throat> after the work on the lunar surface was done, which was wonderful to be an explorer and to go where humans have never been, to set foot on another planet, <clears throat> and then to come home after a successful mission. And the unexpected happened. Looking at Earth like this, this tiny little blue ball looking about twice the size that a full moon looks when you look at it from here. <clears throat> looking at the stars behind and being awestruck by all of this, I suddenly realized from my MIT training in star formation and galactic formation and so forth, <clears throat> the molecules of this body and the molecules of that spacecraft and my partners had been prototyped in an ancient generation of stars. Okay, that's the way it is. But all of a sudden, those were my molecules we were talking about. And it wasn't an intellectual exercise, it was just suddenly damn deeply personal. And <clears throat> it was a feeling experience, it wasn't an intellectual experience. And I suddenly realized that in a way we in science didn't understand, the universe was intelligent, interconnected, and that our modeling of answering the question, who are we and how do we get here, was incomplete and flawed. <clears throat> and that from our cultural cosmologies, coming out of religion, they were archaic and flawed. And now as a spacefaring civilization, the beginnings of spacefaring civilization, we needed to have a new story about ourselves and a new answer to the question, who are we, how did we get here, and where we're going. 
What was interesting was I was accompanied by an ecstasy, a wow, an aha, a eureka. And the question to my linear left brain scientific mind was, okay, what kind of a mind brain is this that causes looking at the universe or looking at the world from different perspective have this sort of euphoric feeling? <clears throat> it wasn't until I got back, curious about this, left NASA a year or so later because it was obvious I wouldn't fly again until the shuttle and I didn't want to fly a desk for 10 years. So one of the first things I did was with some meager funds commissioned to research and we started digging through the ancient mystical literature because <clears throat> neurology and psychology had nothing to say about what was going on. But I needed to understand and thought maybe the mystical literature would help me understand something. And I discovered in digging through the literature <clears throat> that what had happened in space had a name in the ancient Sanskrit called the Salvakapa Samadhi experience, where you see things in their separateness, but you feel them in their connectedness, accompanied by euphoria. I said, wow found something new, didn't know about. That was enough to start me on a 30 years task in founding the Institute of Noetic Sciences <clears throat> to have a mechanism by which we could address with new eyes and new science or new methodology the question of consciousness. What is it, how did it come to be, why is it like it is? Because since for the last 400 years, since Rene Descartes with his famous pronouncement of the separation of mind and body, physicality and spirituality, science and the church have pr proceeded along their individual paths with a minimum of interaction and with a tacit agreement to stay out of each other's backyard. <laughs> but quantum science at the beginning of this century has thrown those two backyards and torn down the fence between them and we needed to start looking from a scientific perspective of what is the nature of consciousness and why are these experiences like they are. Anyhow, we spent 30 years, and many of you out here have spent equally long in some aspect of that study or another. <clears throat> many of you already know that uh, Russell Targ and Hal Putoff and I go back uh, to the early 70s at SRI when we were working, Brendan O'Regan and <clears throat> working in the next office who later became the Institute of Noetic Sciences Research Director. And Willis Harmon was there at the same time. And we were doing the work with Uri Geller and all of us interested in these types of events. What I want to show you tonight <clears throat> is some work that I have been doing for the last few years since the mid-90s, since The Way of the Explorer first came out, in quantum holography. <clears throat> and from my opinion, it is a powerful discovery, and I think you'll see why as we go through, that has the potential, which I believe will be realized over the next decade or so, <clears throat> as we dot all the I's, cross all the T's, and find how this discovery fits in to the picture that we've been trying to create. Now, I know some of the old timers in here, uh, 30 years ago, we've agreed, 30 years ago, we were all over the map trying to propose theories and ideas. How does consciousness, remote viewing, parapsychology, how does all this fit? What's the science behind it? And we had all had our pet theories and they were all like this. 30 years later, we circumscribed the problem. It's coming in together pretty well. Uh, do we have good solid answers? No. We think we have some pretty good ones. We think it's narrowing. We think we're getting a handle on it. <clears throat> we think we're making better sense than we ever have. But we have to remember that our models are never complete until they've been tested and the anomalies and the bugs flushed out and we try to see if there's anything 
trying to disprove our own theory. That's what good science is about, trying to falsify your own concepts to see if they can stand the test of time. Okay, so we are uh, at the end with uh, Dr. Uh, Edgar Mitchell. We're going to Lynn Buchanan. Uh, Lynn has been on our show before, and I've taken you uh, different places with him. And um, one of the things that comes up in, the, in his discussions is the difference between remote viewers and regular psychics. Now, uh, as he explains, remote viewing is a taught science. Uh, some, some psychics, including myself, um, we just get information. You notice, uh, if you notice, when Dr. Mitchell uh, showed you the um, the square with the with the different what look like sparks or particles coming off of it, um, that is sort of like a focus point because lots of times people ask me, uh, how do you arrive at what you did, uh, you know, at, at what you did. Um, in remote viewing, you have a target, like someone gives you an address, so that is what you focus on. But in the matrix, this is all the same, because that is our starting point, and some of us have learned how to take those sparks and uh, use them like an information center. And then we take that, I bring that in, and, and interpret it and put it into some kind of logical uh, storyline for you. And uh, so, perception, as we know, uh, in remote viewing, sometimes you have immediate feedback, like you know if you were right or if you were not right. Even though, uh, in our case, in my case, when we do the predictions uh, on live TV for you, uh, we have no idea what we're looking at and we, we try to translate it as well as we can. And then what happens is we have to wait. <laughs> well, usually we tape in uh, September, October. Well, the year doesn't start for another two or three months. And then as the year goes on, then we see what it was that we was looking at. So sometimes we have the story, we just sort of uh, looked at it from, from a different angle, but the main story is always right. And it is that, that what allows us to measure our accuracy rate, um, the feedback, because it's not immediate. We have to wait to turn on the TV and see what happens, and that's how we arrive at that. And think of poor Nostradamus. Uh, he looked at stuff five, six hundred, well, five hundred years ago, uh, I mean, ahead, and he had no idea what anything looked like, so we really... I really admire Nostradamus, but I feel sorry for him at the same time because people are trying to pick him apart, something awful. We're going, um, we're going to Lynn Buchanan. So, like I was telling you in the beginning, JFK is the reporter, and um, enjoy. What people don't realize is that <clears throat> uh, controlled remote viewing is at its most basic level, it's an interview and report process. That's all it is, you know? And um, that uh, it's like interviewing somebody who speaks a different language. So it's not easy. And it's like interviewing a librarian who speaks a different language. So you ask a question to the subconscious, it goes to the great library that's, who knows what that is, the source of all information, comes back with the answer. And it does that very quickly so that, you know, you don't really notice a time lapse. But uh, then it has to tell you the answer. And you had to get the question across to it. The whole trick is, that the conscious and the subconscious mind don't speak the same language. They never will. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's just part of the human situation. Uh, and so they, uh, they talk to each other through an interpreter. 
And in controlled remote viewing, we use the body as the interpreter. That's why we say that um, controlled remote viewing is a physical discipline as much, every bit as much as a spiritual one. It's a mental martial art. And uh, so <clears throat> in the beginning of a remote viewing session, you say, what's at the target? And you have trained your body to respond to the subconscious awareness of land, water, mm -hmm. and you make this ideogram. And um, at the end of the be at the end of that first part of the session, the viewer can say, well, I don't know what the target is, but I know that there's land there, and I know there's water there, mm -hmm. and I know there's something man-made. Well, that's a start. That gets you to the target. Mm -hmm. Then you move into the second phase of remote viewing, and this is getting your sensory awareness. So you're still using the body, mm -hmm. only now instead of a physical knee-jerk reaction, you're going to start tasting the target, smelling the target, and all that. A lot of people ask why uh, the subconscious doesn't just tell you it's a car. And uh, the subconscious knows what a car is. The conscious mind knows what a car is. But the body doesn't have any way to give you nouns. It can only give you feelings. And so the subconscious has to talk through the body and the body has a very limited vocabulary and so even when the subconscious knows that the target's a car it still has to let you smell a new car smell feel the wind on the face uh you know or feel the the feeling of moving rapidly and stuff like that because that's the only language the body speaks and so this, this whole interview through a translator process is uh, the body is the bottleneck. And so, um, so you have to develop a physical language. Now, when people first come for remote viewing training, we teach them terminology. You know, this is a session, this is an ideogram, this is a target, this is, and so on. But that terminology is not the real language that's going to happen. And that's why when we, uh, when we teach beginners, we start out 100 times. Land, draw a line. Water, draw waves. And such as that. And teach them a physical vocabulary. And we do it. It's, it's got to be the most boring exercise you've ever seen. But um, it's made boring because the conscious mind says, I'm out of here, I'm gonna think of something else. And we continue the exercise and then the subconscious mind is drawing those ideograms and you're getting your subconscious and your body working together. So remote viewing actually has two languages. One is the terminology that we use in sessions and reporting and all that. And the other is a private language that goes on inside of you that lets your subconscious and your conscious mind communicate with one another through the body. And that language is private to every single person. And, uh, and it has to be trained and it has to be learned. It's, it's very much a, a, a topic of language learning only it's a different kind of language than you've ever heard. Well, the fact is, like the, the Akashic Records and the Matrix and all, uh, people think that once they learn remote viewing, their mind can go get that information. Mm -hmm. It can already do that. I mean, it already has, the subconscious already has access. It just needs somebody to tell it what you want. Mm -hmm. And so the process of learning um, uh, remote viewing, controlled remote viewing, is a process of learning how to how to interview your own subconscious, and then you say to your subconscious, describe the land, and your subconscious says, oh, okay, it goes and gets the information and comes back, and so it's very much like you're interviewing 
a librarian who doesn't speak your language through an interpreter, it's a, um, it's a complex process. The uh, matrix is more than you. It is the source of all information. It's just that if it has information that you don't know how to perceive, then you have a filter and so you can't perceive it, but you do have access to it. Um, and uh, I mean, let's start out being really honest here, okay? You have a contract with the government for big bucks and you're the expert in remote viewing and psychic spying and a general or a congressman or someone who's funding you for the following year comes to you as the expert and says, where does this information come from? Are you really going to say, I don't know? <laughs> You're going to say, comes from the matrix. And they're going to say, oh, well, we better fund him for another year. You know? and, uh, and, you know, the matrix is just another way of saying, I have no idea where it comes from. By the way, so is the Akashic Records. It's a phrase that says that somewhere out there, there is all this information. I don't know where it is, but maybe someday I'll be able to access it. And um, it's just names that we give. For that body of information that's out there that includes information about everything that exists, will exist, or has ever existed. And your subconscious mind already has a way to get there. It just has no reason to until you tell it what information you want. Yeah, um, the remote viewer, okay, may have, uh, you know, may not be a nuclear physicist or, or engineer, you know, jet engine engineer or something like that, and gets tasked to explain how the engine on a UFO works or something like that. And they come back <clears throat> and uh, they give explanations. And the problem is that engineers take these explanations and they, at first blush, they tend to say, oh, that's garbage. Because it is not explained in their terminology. And even if it were, it would be explaining things that, they're, that they believe aren't capable, you know, aren't possible yet anyway. And yet what happens is, uh, an analogy that, that you gave before, uh, if you take everything that exists and put a big screen in front of it and only poke a hole on those things that you have experienced, okay? And then let's say you have never experienced a waterfall. Let's say you've never seen a picture of a waterfall and all that, but you have turned the faucet on in the morning and stuck your hands under the water and all. And so I give you a target and in that target, here's this huge waterfall. You have no idea what it is. What are you going to say? It's a faucet mm -hmm. because you have that experience in your, in your life. And so this is a filter that adds to the problem of a remote viewing. Somebody else will look at this and say, there's no faucet there, so you're wrong. But you were right. There is falling water there, and there is, you know, running water and, and all that. And uh, so we perceive, and therefore we explain things through our own personal experience and our own vocabularies. Every now and then, a word that is not within our vocabulary will somehow make it through all that maze of, of problems and get to your mind. And you'll be working a session and you'll come up with the word Grumferfif, you know, and you say, what? <laughs> and so you write it down. Maybe there's somebody in, in the company that you're working for or something, who will know what that means? Maybe nobody does, mm -hmm. but the word made it through. And the word that makes it through like that is almost always thrown away because nobody knows what it means. And so the information comes through, but hey, you know, 
the letter comes in and there's nobody here to open it. <laughs> there's nobody here to receive it because no, it's not addressed to us, you know. And uh, that happens very rarely. Most of the time what happens is groom from from means something that is long and round and silver in some other culture or something. Mm -hmm. And so we know what long is, we know what round is, and we know what the color silver is. So we explain it in the terms that we know. If a viewer can come up with 15% of what their subconscious is perceiving, you got a good viewer. I mean, <laughs> uh, I would say it's more like around two or three percent of what your subconscious knows about the target ever gets down on a sheet of paper in a remote viewing session. Uh, because for one thing, we have a thing called uh, uh, undeclared uh, perceptions. Uh, you say the site has a human element, okay? You pick that up, you declared it. And so then you say, there's a person at the target. You pick that up, you declared it. But you say, there are people at the target. You have just told me that there are people, there is human and all that. But it is so obvious to you that we've got multiples that you never declare it. Absolutely. And, um, and it's these undeclared things. Uh, <clears throat> we'll see, uh, you know, a viewer may see um, there's a tree at the target. In their mind's eye, they have the capability of totally describing that tree. And yet, they say there's a tree and go on. That's Here's a tree, there are mountains, the sky. Oh, where are you? Well, I'm inside looking out a window. Uh -huh. Oh, you didn't say that. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm outdoors. You didn't say that either, you know. And so, um, yeah, there are many of these undeclared descriptors and mm -hmm. uh, ver actually very little of what is perceived by a remote viewer actually winds up on the paper and then into the summary and gets to the uh, customer or the tasker or whatever. Uh, this is, you know, again, training. We, we have to teach people. You see a tree, describe it, you know. And one of the things that makes a difference between a good remote viewer and a, quote, world-class remote viewer is a world-class remote viewer may not have any more talent, may not have any more natural capability, and may not have any more control over the structure and the process of remote viewing but he's curious. He finds a tree, he wants to know about that tree. He finds a building, he wants to know what's going on inside. If I gave you the keys to the White House and I gave you a cloak of invisibility so that you couldn't get caught, would you actually go to the White House, go in and say, oh, it's big, it's old, uh, it's important, it's political, and turn around and leave? No. You would have the keys, you would have, you couldn't get caught. I mean, you would, you would go through everything, you know? And, uh, and a remote viewer who is curious about the target may not even be as good or as naturally talented as another remote viewer but he's going to do better because he's curious. We have several ways to pull information out of a remote viewer. One of the quickest ways is uh, a remote viewer says, okay, there's a building over there. And the monitor says, huh? Oh, there's, and that immediately focuses the viewer's attention on that building, and then the monitor says, well, tell me about it, you know. It's a very simple process, mm -hmm. but the monitor can focus the viewer onto some part of the site. 
um, if the monitor is curious. And, uh, you know, when you're monitoring yourself, you go along and you say, okay, I'm, you know, at this site and everything, there's a building over there. Huh? It does it. It triggers that curiosity and it gets a remote viewer looking at details and details and details. And that's where the good information actually comes from. Now, uh, there is a rule that we make and uh, this rule applies to a whole lot more than remote viewing. Uh, the rule says that a noun is a box that you hide things in. And so I'm going along and I say, uh, there's something that is big and red and moving. It's a fire truck. Stray Cat or AOL, it's a fire truck, okay? Between the word moving and the word fire truck, a viewer will get like a hundred separate perceptions just as fast as it can go. They don't know what to do with them, so they scoop them up, they throw them in a box, shut the lid, and label it fire truck. And in controlled remote viewing, we have controls for just everything. Uh, by the way, controlled remote viewing doesn't mean the viewer is controlled. It means the viewer is in control. Big difference. Uh, and the, the natural psychic is at the mercy of their ability in remote viewing. In controlled remote viewing, the viewer is in control. But um, then we have a way, a set of controls in controlled remote viewing where the viewer can open the box and one at a time pull out all those perceptions that came one microsecond apart from each other, can pull them out one at a time and tell us more about the target and, uh, and get all those details. It's very well, uh, it's very hard for a viewer to uh, uh, differentiate between the signal and your imagination. Uh, there are several very good reasons for that. And once you understand those reasons, they become useful as tools. Um, let's say that, uh, back to the thing with the, you know, the faucet instead of the, uh, the waterfall. Uh, when your imagination pops in or some analogy or metaphor pops in, that came from somewhere and you're focused on the target, well, there is a kernel of truth about that. And so you have to recognize when something is coming in metaphorically. You have to come recognize when you're saying one thing but meaning something else. Because, you know, a viewer will often say, oh, it's like a faucet, but not exactly. Or they'll say, it's like a faucet, but it's really big. Something like that. And so in their mind, they know it's not a faucet. And yet they have said that noun. So we make them put the noun aside and then we make them pull things out. Oh, it's a faucet? Okay. Open that box and start pulling things out. Well, it's big. It's a mile away from me. I can still feel the mist on my face from it. Also, it's outdoors. Also, there's no silver thing up there. There's only sky. Mm -hmm. And so one at a time, we pull these things out of the box and find out what made them scoop all this up, throw it into a box, and label it faucet. Because faucet's the only word they knew. So the imagination takes over. Analogies take over. Metaphors pop in and all that. And in controlled remote viewing, we know that's not garbage. Mm -hmm. That's good stuff. It's just in a in a ball of stuff that's not good. It's you know. The nature of the information transfer. It's the nature you of the transfer. You have to deal with that. You have to deal with it. And that's where the art comes in. That's right. And once we learn, you know, once once you learn how to take the proper tools and dig that kernel of information out of that garbage, hey the information that comes out is great, and it's accurate. Uh, 
some of the benefits of controlled remote viewing are one, uh, it can be learned by anybody. You don't have to have the natural psychic talent and all that. And um, it can be practiced to expand and as you practice, it actually makes you better and better and better. Some of the drawbacks of remote viewing is it has to be learned and it has to be practiced. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and so that's a double-edged sword there. If you want to be a good remote viewer, which is generally better than a natural psychic because you get all the detail and everything else. If you want to do that, it takes training and it takes work. I mean, be totally honest about it. It's not easy. It's really not. Patience, yeah. Those are the two P words that all of our students hate to hear is practice and patience. Uh, no, don't say that. <laughs>
fast, real targets that you can learn from, that you can hit the ball, see where it goes, and say, what corrections do I need to make? Unlearning when you come for remote viewing training is uh, multifaceted and is a big thing. For one thing, no matter how much we tell people there's no magic involved here, that it's all science, they come expecting magic. We have to teach them, we have to unlearn that expectation, destroy the expectation. But what we replace it with is success. And that's always a whole lot more fascinating, a whole lot better for people. So that's one place of unlearning and then reteaching. Um, another place of unlearning, uh, we have an analogy that we use of um, uh, Ug and Og. Um, Ug and Og are walking through the primeval forest and they hear a twig snap behind them. Og says, saber-toothed tiger, and takes off running. Ug turns around and says, uh, what's that, you know? Well, guess whose descendants we are? Um, I'm in the process of writing a book simply about this called uh, the, the Children of Og, you know? But uh, the fact is that from the most primordial day in our human history, the person who could identify something the fastest and react is the one who survived. And now then, we're coming and we're telling you, no, 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 don't tell me what it is. Describe it. Because your, your body cannot transfer the information of what it is. It can only transfer the descriptions of it. And so your conscious mind jumps to conclusions. Oh, that's a fire truck. And we say, no, no, no. Set fire truck aside. Now then tell me what you felt. Tell me what you saw and, and describe what made you decide it was a fire truck. So we pull all that back out. Oh, it's very difficult. Yeah, it's very difficult to let go of that. It's a fire truck. That's right. Except the target, you know, and, and except your conscious mind. And the problem with it is uh, you say, well, it's big and it's red and it's noisy. Oh, I'll bet it's a fire truck. And I'm sorry, but there are a lot of big, red, noisy things. And, uh, and you know, you have zeroed in on fire truck. And so your conscious mind says, oh, then there must be a fire. Oh, there is a burning building. Oh, there are people in danger and all that, okay? And, uh, you know, the target may be a, a red car, mm -hmm. something like that. And yet it's big, it's red, it's noisy, it's moving. Oh, it's a fire truck. Therefore, there must be a fire. And all of a sudden you're off. And, uh, and actually what the customer wanted was the best selling color for their new line of cars. Right. And you're describing people falling out of buildings and, and all this yeah. other stuff yeah, yeah. because because you bought into that noun. Um, nouns will, will ruin a remote viewer. Oh boy, your so conscious mind takes a lot of training, a lot of practice. And uh, you know, um, the remote viewing process parallels our lives very closely. Absolutely. And uh, we have learned that the difference between two remote viewers is generally not a difference in ability. If they're both following the same scientific principles, mm -hmm. they're both gonna come up with generally the same accuracy, but they're gonna do it in a different way according to that person's lifestyle and that person's uh, old habits. And um, you know, a person who's, who's curious in life is gonna be curious in remote viewing. A person who immediately jumps to a conclusion and reacts in life is gonna do the same thing in remote viewing. And this is the reason why many times we have such a hard time taking that person and unlearning 
many of their life habits. Mm -hmm. And um, teaching a remote viewer is just as hard as learning to be a remote viewer. And you're talking to <laughs> I hope this week's show was informative and enjoyable for you. Lynn is in our area occasionally and he teaches classes and uh, some of you actually, <laughs> there's a little story connected to that. Uh, I did an interview with Lynn one time and uh, he was going to be in the Seattle, Portland area and um, <laughs> so we talked about it and some of you decided to take his class and uh, I was getting ready to go on the road and one of my stops was Lynn Buchanan's house where he lives in New Mexico. And it took me, well, several, well, a week or two or three to get there. Well, when I got to his house, what happened is I had advertised him so well, or if you want to use that word, he had to teach more classes to accommodate all of you. So he was stuck in Seattle and I was stuck at his house. So um, that's how it works sometimes. And it, it's not for everybody, just so you know. Uh, it's. Uh, it's a little big responsibility to do something like that. And then, um, but I just love Lynn. He, he's such a, he's such a, such a people person. Uh, it, when you, if you don't know who he is, you know, but, uh, and I've said this before, sometimes we go to the grocery store and you, there's somebody behind you and uh, maybe they bump us or something like that. You never know who you're gonna run into because you never know who a person really is, uh, you know, unless you take the time to find out. So much for that. That concludes show number two in our four-week series. And uh, give it some thought and uh, maybe there's something you'd like to look into and broaden your horizon a little bit, unless you're already way out there, and <laughs> then maybe we can categorize a little bit for you. I gotta say thank you to the cameraman. Cameraman. Yes ma'am. Thank you. You're welcome. Mike Johns. See you next week uh, with another Li Lindy Cannon uh, episode. Bye. This is the time of the show.